All right, I'm David A. Wheeler, and this is MetaMath Lamp. This is what it really looks like. Uh, it may look a little different to you. Uh, your version that you're running may be slightly different. That said, um, <clears throat> we're going to use MetaMath Lamp to create a proof. In this particular case, we're going to prove that 2 plus 2 is 4. To use MetaMath Lamp, you basically go to a website using a web browser, get started. And there's some basic steps. First, we're going to have to pick a data a context, a database to use. Uh, then we're going to set fundamental proof information. At the very least, you usually want to set uh, a sentence description. What are we doing? We're going to add a goal, and then we're going to add any hypotheses if we need it. Um, set the labels to whatever we want, and then create the proof. Basically, create step after step to show that whatever goal it is that we have is true. Once we have proven the goal, we can then use show completed proof and generate a uh, compressed MetaMath proof. Uh, you can hover over each of these things if you're using a mouse, so you don't have to memorize everything. When I say the word click here, I mean either a quick uh, press and release on a mouse button, specifically the left mouse button, or a quick tap, a quick press and release on a touch screen. I'm going to use the word click for both uh, clicks with the mouse and taps on a screen. Um, edits in MetaMath Lamp by default require a long click. In other words, holding it down for a moment, say a second, and then releasing it. Same for a touch screen, holding it down, then releasing it. Uh, you can also, if you're using a mouse, hold down the Alt key and just do normal click, and that will be the same as a long click. And the Alt key on some keyboards is labeled Opt or Option. All right, so let's try to prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we're going to focus really on how to use the MetaMath Lamp tool. So first I need to get a database. Um, I need to set up my context. I'm going to load it from the web. I could load local files as well. And since set mm and I set mm are especially common, they're preset. Set mm, I'm going to choose, I'm going to download that. And that uh, uses classical logic and ZFC set theory. Now I could read it all, but if I tried to prove two plus two equals four after reading in the whole database, it's just going to find that, oh, I can easily prove that. I'll just reuse the existing proof. So we are going to stop before the existing proof of 2 plus 2 equals 4, which is called 2P2E4, and that way the prover won't automatically reuse the existing proof. Once we've set up our context, we apply changes. Now it's loading in the context. There we go. All right. So we are now ready to proceed now that we have set up our, um, our context. Okay. Now, if you have a small display, say a smartphone, uh, and you're using its default display. Uh, MetaMath Lamp works great. However, you might want to configure it. So I'm gonna go over here to menu, and I'm going to show you various view options. Um, if you are on a small phone display, you might wanna turn on compact mode and small buttons and then close. Uh, that's going to use up less display space and therefore it's probably gonna be more comfortable on a small display. I'll, I'll later on give a couple more tricks and tips for small displays. All right, when we are creating a proof using MetaMath Lamp, typically you want to start by, uh, <clears throat> by adding the goal statement. What are we trying to prove? So I'm going to click on this plus sign over here. Okay, this plus icon basically means add a new step. And just to be clear, this here is a tab bar and down here we have the um, a, a whole bunch of icons for the editor. I'll click on the plus here, and I'm going to enter in my goal. Open paren two plus two equals four. And you notice I put spaces to separate every symbol. You don't need a space at the very beginning or the very end, but you need spaces between all the other symbols. Okay, I'm going to save. I could push this icon, the save icon. I'm just going to push enter. Okay, 
2 plus 2 is 4. Uh, now, we're using the set mm database. The set mm database is very picky about parentheses. If you're having any function that is an infix function, taking two classes, producing a class, it's got to be surrounded by parentheses. That eliminates all sorts of potential ambiguities. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, let's, uh, now, you'll notice that there's a G right here. This means this is a goal statement. Uh, you can have, well, at most one goal statement. Um, and by default, MetamathLamp will keep the goal statement at the bottom to uh, make things uh, simpler. All right. Now, for our purposes, we're going to relabel the goal. Right now, it's labeled default as QED. Let's give it a real name, okay? Instead of, and I've held down and done a long click on the label of this step. Um, remember, a long click is the way to edit values. Let me repeat that. If you want to edit information in MetaMath Lamp, by default, you use a long click. Let's change QED to 2P2E4. Very good. All right, so <clears throat> this is now labeled 2P2E4. You can have any alphanumerics in your labels. Uh, but you generally want to have the label, the goal statement, what you're going to want to use is the final label in a database. Okay. And that label can't conflict with an existing label in the context. Right. Uh, we could, by the way, change um, how we edit things from a long click using settings, but we're not going to do that right now. Now, let's set the description here. I'm going to Go over here and long click on this area that lets us type in the description. Okay, and I'm going to say prove that two plus two equals four. <clears throat> By convention in set MM, the first sentence of a description is an overall summary of whatever it is you're trying to prove. Uh, <clears throat> and it's really helpful to have at least uh, that brief description there, uh, helping you remember, oh yes, this is what we're trying to accomplish here. Now, the MetaMath Lab actually has a lot of shortcuts. One of them is you can just do a simple click on these field names, like on description, and that will also let you edit the field because after all, you're not going to edit this field, so you must mean that you really want to edit the contents of this field. I'm gonna go over here, click here to cancel. I could also push the escape key to cancel. All right, now, Let's do a little review of this interface. We've already noticed at the top here, this is the context. In fact, we can open it up and we expand it and collapse it to show the uh, context. Settings, if I click on that tab, will let me change various configuration settings. We're in the editor and the Explorer will let us look at more information about the context. This line right here uh, is has a whole bunch of icons that let you manipulate the proof. And so this line here is called the editor command icon bar. It's the editor command icon and it's a bar of them. Okay. Uh, we've already used one of those icons, this plus symbol here, which adds a new step. Okay. Um, you can hover over an icon to see what it does. Uh, let me talk briefly about what these icons are. This lets you select or deselect all the steps. This lets you move selected steps down. This moves selected steps up. This adds a new step. This deletes selected steps. This duplicates a selected step. This merges steps. They're similar. This lets you uh, add new steps from existing assertions. Basically, you're doing a search to uh, create new steps. This is a substitution command. It's a general substitution. It's going to let you type in a uh, one expression and a second expression, and it's going to replace all the instances of that first expression into uh, those second expression, that second expression, all the way through all the steps of the proof. And finally, unify. If you click on this when there's no steps selected, it will attempt to just briefly uh, verify or or um, you know, every one of the steps, okay, to determine whether or not it can prove that. And it will fill in if there's a, if there's a simple theorem that's easily proven from, 
from the information available. <clears throat> All right. If you click on this unify button, when there is a step selection, something different happens. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, that will enable something called the bottom-up prover. And finally, there's a menu button over here, which gives you a bunch of additional actions. Okay. Down here are a sequence of steps. Inside each step is some various information, uh, a checkbox to determine whether or not the step is selected, a label, a, a unique uh, name for it, what kind it is, if it's a G, that means it's a goal. If it's an H, it's a hypothesis. Uh, almost everything else is going to be a provable statement, a P. Then the justification, and finally the statement. In a completed proof, every step used in the proof has to have a justification, okay, that's been verified as, as being correct, okay? Now that we've kind of walked through the interface, let's think about how we're going to actually prove that two plus two equals four. Now there's a lots of ways to do proofs. You can do them bottom up, you can do them top down, you can just type in a whole bunch of things that you believe are true, try to and try to connect them up, uh, kind of a middle out approach. Um, in many cases, we can prove things by identifying definitions of whatever it is we want to prove, expanding those definitions, and just repeatedly doing that and simplifying until you can show that, um, that the entire statement is true. Okay, and that's what we're going to do in this case. So I'm going to first notice that this uh, claim uses the symbol four, okay? Two plus two is four. So let's see if we can find out a definition for four, or at least something that four is equivalent to. So I'm gonna click on this magnifying glass here, and let's find something that's, Let's look for four equals three plus one. Now the way um, patterns are implemented in Metamath Lamp is you type in a sequence of symbols, space separated symbols, and it's going to reply with everything it can find where the conclusion has that first symbol, and then sometime later the second symbol, and then sometime later the third, all of that within the conclusion. So I'm going to do a search and it found a single result. Uh, DF4 says that four is equal to three plus one. This is in fact in, in set.mm, the definition of the number four. So that's my one option. I'll select it and I will click on choose the selected one. And there we go. We now have a new step using the statement four equals three plus one, and it is justified by df4 you'll see this colon the df4 it means we're using df4 to justify it, and it doesn't need any other steps to uh to use this okay all righty <clears throat> now again notice this letter this bold letter p that means this is a provable statement okay now this definition of four depends on three we don't have three anywhere else. Let's do it again. We're going to do a search for this definition of three. But you know, I just noticed something. DF-4, that looks like a naming convention. You know, sometimes we can just use the fact that we something looks like a naming convention to help us find it. So we're going to do that. We're going to click over this label and type in DF-3. Okay, and do a search. It finds several... Uh, <clears throat> several possibilities, including this one. Three is equal to two plus one. That looks like what I want. We're going to choose it, push on this, choose, click on the choose selected, and now we have a definition of three. Now we need to connect this definition of four and this definition of three. So <clears throat> the obvious way to do that would be take this definition of three and add one after it. Because if I put on both sides, if I took this definition of one and add one on this side, and of course the same on the other side, that would pair up this definition of three in step two with this definition of four in step one. Okay, so let's add a new statement. I'm just going to use good old add statement. Click on this plus. And I'm going to type in what I want. In parentheses, three plus one equals sign. Okay, and now we're going to use this, two plus one, plus another one after it. Remember, I have, all my symbols have to have spaces between them. All right, see how that works? 
Okay, now, now that I've entered my new statement, I'm going to click on Unify. And yes, and it have found that yes, indeed, DF3 and DF4 do indeed uh, just, you know, those justifications are valid, but it's also found a justification for this new step I just added. OVEQ1I, which is justified by using two. And what this means is that it could take three and two plus one, add a one on the right hand side in both cases and produce that. That's what OVEQ1I does for me, okay? Uh, but notice I didn't have to know that, I just typed what I wanted and the tool is able to find that for me. Okay. All right, now we're going to use, you know, using this as the reference and this as the hypotheses within the justification, okay? All right, now we could later on connect this three plus one sometime in the great future to this four, but you know what? It's often on a larger proof, it can get confusing. It's much better to just try to clean up as you go along. If I'm going to use four eventually as meaning two plus one plus one, then why don't I just make that assertion now? Now I could just type that in as I did before, but instead of typing all that in, I'm going to use the duplicate state st uh, command to get us started. So I'm going to pick this statement, new statement, step three, select it and click on duplicate. Now, Metamath Lamp is complaining because it, uh, there are now two steps with exactly the same statement. It's a duplicate, which is correct. Okay, that's what a duplicate does. So that's telling me that I need to make some changes here. Okay. Um, now, let's fix that. Let's fix the fact that's a duplicate. Now, we could long click on this new text and edit it into what we want. But I'd like to, now is a good time for us to introduce some new capabilities in MetaMath Lamp, something called statement fragments. Okay, I'm going to do a simple click, not a long click. Long click would let me edit, okay? I'm going to do a, a simple click on that left parentheses, so the left of the first of that three, okay? Notice what it did here. It has selected this entire expression and created a whole new bar underneath called, okay? And this is what's called the statement fragment mechanism. This lets you select and manipulate fragments of statements in a syntax aware way. This means you don't have to constantly ca uh, count out parentheses and all that nonsense, okay? Um, now, exactly what statement fragment selected depends on the symbol that you choose to select on. And you can also make changes to it. For example, this one says expand selection. You'll notice that all of a sudden expanded to beyond the equal. You can also shrink now I can create a new statement above using the fragment selected or a statement below, a whole new step with that statement, a whole new step below with that statement, okay, that's selected. I can copy what's selected into a clipboard. I can edit, I can cancel. What I'm going to do is edit, but when I edit, whatever I've selected as, with my fragment selector is still selected. So now I have three plus one equals that, and all I have to do is type a four. See what happened? It was selected. I typed in something, it went away. And now instead of having to retype that old phrase, I can just change what I wanted to change. Okay, much simpler and helpful um, is, and helpful as your expressions get longer. Okay, now uh, I'm going to save this. I could push the save icon. I can also just press return. Okay, or which on some uh, cool, um, either return or enter, it depends on your computer, what that key is labeled. Now let's click on Unify again. Okay, again, with no steps selected, and we're just gonna click on Unify. All right, and it was able to find that, oh yes, four is equal to two plus one plus one. And it's based on using steps one and three. It started with four equals three plus one. And then it started with this other step, number three, that it found that three plus one is equal to two plus one plus one. And using one and three, uh, EQ2 or TRI basically means that equality is transitive. So if four equals three plus one and three plus one equals two plus one plus one, then four equals two plus one plus one. Okay, but I didn't have to memorize this. I gave the steps and the, the new statements and was able to figure that out. Okay, now, 
So we have an interesting expression. Uh, like we've expanded four into something else. Okay. Now let's try the other side, two plus two. We don't have anything else that shows us what two plus two is. So we need to figure out a way to expand. So we have two symbols, two and two. Well, we're probably going to need to expand two. All right. So let's do that. I'm going to click on this. And we already know what the naming convention is. We'll use that too. DF-2, click on search. We find a number of options. Let's choose DF-2, which is 2 plus 1 plus 1. Okay. And so now we have 2 equals 1 plus 1. Um, obviously, this definition of 2 is kind of similar to the value expanded for 4. Okay. 4 is 2 plus 1 plus 1. We got a 1 and a 1 here. We got a 1 and a 1 here. This looks a lot like if I added two on the left hand sides of both of, of this definition of two, it would look a lot like this one. Okay. You know, two plus two equals two plus one plus one. Well, the two plus one plus one looks a whole lot like two plus one plus one, right? Those are very, very similar. Right. So I'm going to take this definition of two and add two to both sides. Okay. All right, so I'm going to take the two equals one plus one, select it. Let's do a duplicate. Again, MetaMath is, com uh, is complaining right now because we have exactly duplicate statements, which of course they are, that's what duplicate does. And now I'm going to do a long click on the statement. Okay, and I'm just going to hand edit it in. Okay, two plus two equals Two plus one plus one. All right. So, um, and I've pressed enter or return. Okay. Now, um, now we're going to click on that unify icon again. Again, it could figure out that this, since two plus equals one plus one, it figured out a rule using that step to then prove this one. Now we've got a lot of proven statements. We certainly don't have the goal proven yet, but we have more information that's getting us closer and closer. So basically what we've shown, okay, is that four is equal to two plus one plus one. And we've also shown that two plus two, the other, the left-hand side of our goal is equal to two plus one plus one. These two statements are really similar. If we could prove that these two statements are equal, then we could finish our proof. Okay. So we need to make sure that we are going to end up with something that looks a lot like our goal step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select our goal step and make a copy. If I copy, if I duplicate our goal step, it's much more likely to result in something that we can use. Now you'll notice that when I duplicated it, it didn't end up in the bottom because by default, Minimath Lamp tries to eat goals at the bottom. So this new step is just before the goal. So I have two plus two equals is equal to four. And what I would normally do is edit this statement. I'm just going to long click on it. And I would change that two plus two here to be the same as the two plus one plus one. Obviously, you could also use um, the uh, statement fragment capabilities to do this. Okay. And I will replace the four with the statement here. So something like you know, two plus one plus another one. Okay, so this is what I would normally do because, you know, in fact, um, you know, that's, we know that that's going to look much more like the goal. And as humans, we know this is true. Okay? That's because addition is what's called associative. In other words, if you have a sequence of two additions, you can add the, the first two together and then the second, or the second two and then the first, and it doesn't matter. The results are always the same. That's called associativity. Okay? And addition is associative. Now, does the MetaMask database in our current context already have this information. Is there a theorem about this? Well, I've already previously searched, said I'm M. And in fact, it does have a theorem about this, but it's in the other order. It, it does, uh, on the left-hand side, it adds these, the first two first. Okay. 
Now, uh, what I would normally do here is I would accept this step as I've just typed it here and add another step um, if I knew that Metamath had, that this particular database had it in a certain order, I would then add a, yet another step with that order. And that makes it really, really easy for the tool to, okay, match this and then swap and, you know, makes it much, much easier to do. However, um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to do something a little different here uh, for the sake of demonstration, for demonstration purposes. I'm going to swap these two sides ahead of time. Okay. In other words, even though I know this is the goal order, that's not the order I'm going to present to the MetaMath LAMP tool because I want to show that, in fact, you can make proofs even if you don't do it that way. But I also want to show that even if you match the order precisely you, uh, within a database, you may not get a useful result from a simple unification. In many cases, simple unification doesn't work, and we'll, um, I'll explain why. First, let's try to do this, okay? So we have this theorem, two plus one plus one equals two plus one plus one. I'm gonna save it, and as an experiment, I'm going to click on unify. It didn't prove this. Now, why is that? I already said, I mean, you could look in the database that in fact, this is the right order of the symbols, okay? Yet, MetaMath LAMP will not automatically prove this step. Why? In fact, this isn't unusual at all. It often happens that we can't just use a rule, even if you use it in the right order, because that rule has hypotheses, requirements, that haven't themselves been proven yet. This simple unify will only prove uh, statements if it has all the information necessary to use the rule, okay? Now, <clears throat> We can do this, but we need to do something, use something different called a bottom-up search to find such proofs. Uh, bottom-up uh, pr uh, proofs can even work through several different layers. Let's talk though first about what exactly is going on. As I mentioned before, this particular context, this particular database does have this information. It has the symbols in the right order. Um, but if you looked at that database, what you'd find is, yes, addition is associative for complex numbers. So you first, in order to, have to use this rule, have to prove that each of the symbols, the items being used, are in fact complex numbers. We have two and one, and nowhere here is there a proof, a statement, that one and two are complex numbers. Now, it turns out the database also has statements that one and two are complex numbers, but they haven't been brought into this specific proof, so they can't be used yet as hypotheses, okay? Now, there's no need for you to have known all this ahead of time, okay? Um, I'm just trying to illustrate a general point um, that sometimes a theorem that you'd like to use requires other things to be true before you can use it. Okay, even if the symbols of its conclusion happen to match up precisely. So instead, we're going to use bottom-up proof to solve this. Okay? A bottom-up search can add new steps. Okay? And that's going to enable us to do things like prove this claim. Okay? So to do, enable a bottom-up search, you first click on the step you want to uh, search on that you need to prove that it hasn't been proved yet. And then you click on the Unify button, but you click on it after you've selected a particular step. And now we have the proving bottom up dialogue. This will enable us to search for a solution backwards from our currently selected step using the context and previous steps. Okay. And there's all sorts of dialogue options here that will let us prove the selected step. The reference manual goes into much more information. Uh, these dialogue steps control how MetaMath LAMP will search for proof of the claim, okay? Now, when you adjust these parameters in the dialog bo box here, you're making trade-offs, okay? Allowing the search to do more will increase the likelihood of finding a proof, but it will also increase the time it takes. It'll make search take longer. Experience is gonna help you figure out which parameters to use in which circumstances. For now, I, I know that this is very unlikely to need allowing new disjoints and allowing new variables. So I'm going to turn that off. 
that will speed up my search by not allowing those things. I will, however, lead on allowing new steps. It's not at all unusual that I need to add new steps. In fact, in this case, I must. So I'm going to allow that. Let's see if MetaMathLamp can prove this. Okay, so we have to know that, in fact, that it's in the right order, but apparently there are other things it requires. Push prove. And there we go. All right. And right over here, um, we found, you know, a number of different things we could apply. But this first one says, if I use, um, you know, add ASSI, which is add as associative, and two other claims that prove that one is a member of the complex numbers and two is a, mem a member of the set of complex numbers, I can prove the whole thing. So I'm going to choose that. Okay, click on it, apply selected. Wow, suddenly a lot has happened here, okay? We now have some new steps that have been added to our proof. Namely that one is a member of the, one E period CC, that means one is a member of the complex members, and two E period CC, two is a member of the complex numbers, okay? We now have also proved this statement, okay, using, um, a, a theorem that ad addition is associative. And in fact, that was enough information for the tool to figure out that it can also prove the final goal. We now have a green check mark next to all our steps, showing that all the steps have been proven, and in particular, the final goal, t, uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, has been proven. Okay? If you're new to MetaMath, not familiar with formal systems, you may not understand exactly how a program figures out when to mark a green check mark. And basically, the green check mark means that MetaMath Lamp is able to find for that step a theorem or axiom in this justification here that matches the claim using the steps that it lists ahead of time. Now, I was showing some different options to try to give you an idea of how the tool works. I should note that MetaMath Lamp actually could have done a lot more automation for us. I in intentionally added this statement about um, associativity and so on, but in fact, we didn't need to do that, right? Uh, I'm just trying to show different ways the tools can be used. Now, these step numbers are completely arbitrary. Okay. It doesn't matter what they are, as long as each one of them is distinct. Um, there are some additional rules for the goal and hypotheses. If you have any, they have to be unique in a database. If you're going to add them to a database, they can't be used in the current context. The other ones, though, it doesn't matter what they are. Uh, they're just identifiers while you're creating a proof. However, I kind of like them to be a little more organized. So I'm going to go click on this menu and click on Renumber Steps. And now... I have renumbered all the steps that were just numbers. Now you can rename any step to a non-numeric value if that helps you remember what that is, in which case the renumber steps will leave that alone. Okay, but if it's just a bunch of digits, it'll renumber them. Okay. Now we can now show the completed proof. So I'm going to click on the goal statement. Actually, first I need to unify again, okay? And then I'm going to click on my final statement, click on my menu, and show completed proof. And look at that. We, this is a compressed MetaMath proof. If you copy this using copy, you can then paste it into uh, a text file, an email, database, whatever. This is uh, adequate to uh, put into a database to prove something. You'll notice that our description has been copied in as a comment. Uh, we have the label of the final proof statement, a statement that this is something to be provable, the statement to be proved, and this stuff over here is a compressed form of the proof that we just had. Now, if you want to see a little more of exactly what it's sending, you can, can click on proof table. Actually, let me Okay, and if you show a proof table, this is showing the proof as it will appear in final form. You know, here's, here are these two columns. On the left is just a simple step number. Uh, the next two columns are the justification, a reference to whatever is being used, and the steps being used as the hypotheses, and then the final statement. 
Um, right now, this is showing only the essentials. Uh, it's not showing the proofs of syntact what, why things are syntactically the right types. If you turn that off, you can show that, in fact, internally in a Metamath proof, it all, not only has to prove what you would think of as proof, it also has to prove the types of everything. And it, if you turn off the essentials only, then it will show the proofs of these syntactic statements, um, basically syntactic proofs. I'm going to close this down. Excellent. So that's how you create a proof and extract that proof out uh, to be used into a larger database. Now, when you finally have a final proof, you can extract it out and store it in a database, but you can't extract a final proof until you have a final proof. If you're spending a little time, it's really nice to be able to store your current state, restore it later, maybe on a different device, maybe sent to somebody else. So I'm going to go over and click on this menu button. You can export your current state to JSON, even if you're not completed, and you can import some JSON state and bring it back in whatever that state is. Um, if you store it into a file, the conventional name is whatever it is, dot lamp dot JSON. Basically, it's a JSON file, but not just any JSON file. It's a lamp JSON file. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, in Metamath, every step of a valid completed proof must be the application of an axiom or proven theorem. Okay, and it can possibly use previously proven steps. Okay, uh, MetaMath Lamp can show when it uh, verify this by displaying the green check mark. That's what these green check marks are all about. Okay, now <clears throat> let's look at uh, OVEQ2I. Okay, this one basically shows that this particular step is justified by reference to theorem OVEQ2I. And in order for OVEQ2I to work, it needs another an hypothesis. And we're going to use step three as its hypothesis, which is the definition of two. Okay. While editing, you can click, um, you, if you're an advanced user, you can actually do a long click on this and edit it if you want to use, try to use a different justification. Okay. Or delete a justification. Now, but what in fact does this justification mean? Well, MetaMath Lamp includes something called visualization, which really makes it a lot easier to understand. So I'm going to uh, do a simple click on that green check mark and expose a visualization. In this case of, um, okay, in this case, we're going to do a visualization of OVEQ2I in this particular step. Okay, we're doing a visualization of this step uh, that two plus two equals two plus one plus one. All right, the first row after this is the list horizontally of all the steps being used as inputs, as hypotheses. In this case, we're just using step three, okay, which is two equals one plus one. Below each of those steps is a, a restated that step. In this case, it's two equals one plus one, which is in fact what it says right here, okay? If there were more steps being used as inputs, you would see them uh, grow out horizontally. In the center is the key. This is a description, a, a simple graphical visualization of what OVEQ2I is all about. OVEQ2I requires um, a set of preconditions and has a result, okay? This horizontal line separates the preconditions from the result. In this case, the precondition is that A equals B, okay? And that's the only precondition here. And this long line separates the preconditions Okay, which will be listed horizontally from a single result, which in this case is that CFA is equal to CFB. In this particular application of OVEQ2I on step four, we are setting A to be two and B to be one plus one. Okay, now that's fine. Okay, but if you set A to be two and B to be one plus one, then every time A and B show up in this bottom result, they also have to be the same value. So if A is two, then A has to be two down here. If B is one plus one, then B has to be one plus one down here. Now C and F don't have any other constraints other than syntax constraints. So they can be whatever we want, as I said, subject to certain constraints like syntax constraints. So in fact, we'll set C to be two, F to be plus, and that means that two plus two is equal to two plus one plus one. This is substitution. Okay. And in fact, 
every step in a MetaMath proof, every step is an application of substitution. There are no exceptions. Okay. <clears throat> and the, oh, these boxes and lines let you see how this particular proof of this particular step uh, happened. Okay. Now you can also hide the visualization. Just click on this check mark, green check mark again and it goes away now you can do um you can show off other statements okay let's visualize this one down here okay um add associative and you'll notice down here that we're using two and one and one again it's perfectly fine to reuse a statement um a, a step when it's asking for hypotheses this particular um referent add assi which is, means basically addition is associative has three requirements a has to be in the complex numbers b has to be in the complex numbers and c has to be in the complex numbers and we'll use two and one and steps numbers two and one and one two says two is in the complex numbers one one in the complex numbers one in the complex numbers and that's a b and c and um add assi says that a plus b plus c is well, it says that a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c and so we substitute them in and it turns out in this case two plus one plus one is equal to two plus one plus one please do try out visualization on the different steps we really i really think that if you look at these visualizations of these different steps you'll get a much better understanding of what is going on here okay now you can change the order of steps what you just need to do is select something and move it up and down so i'm going to check on the one that says three plus one right here okay if i click on this i can move it up and down if i click on up i move it up if i click it down i move it down now i can keep moving it up but if i move it up too far you'll notice that this justification says i'm going to use this referent and this hypothesis but wait a minute five doesn't happen till later Okay, a justification can only refer to steps that precede it. This prevents circular logic. Metamath Lamp's bottom-up prover could have automated more for us when we were creating this proof. Uh, so let's return to our earlier situation before we added statements that used the fact that addition was associative. It could have actually found that all by itself. Here's how we're going to do that. We're going to go back by just deleting some things. So we're going to use the checkboxes to select the statement that one is a member of the complex numbers, two is a member of the complex numbers, and this associativity statement. Okay, we selected them, use the trash can, delete, and delete those steps. Okay. Now we're going to long click on this justification that we're not going to use anymore. And we're going to delete that justification. All right, see, we've now reverted back to that state we were in before we added the assertion that addition is associative. Okay. Now, we didn't actually have to hunt for that theorem that addition is associative at all. Uh, we could have let MetamathLamp do more for us automatically. And, and here's one way we could have done that. Okay. Instead of trying to get all that stuff, we could have just selected the goal itself and then click on the unify symbol again bringing up the bottom up prover now we want to set the search options to find the proof automatically now just like before uh, we're going to leave allow new steps we think we're going to need to add new steps we're not going to include allow new disjoints allow new variables i think it's unlikely to help it'll just slow things down we're going to change the statement length restriction here to be unrestricted. The, the statement length restriction um, is a heuristic where it skips a lot of parts of the search under the theory that, hey, those are unlikely. If, I, if the statements keep getting longer, I'm unlikely to act, find a resulting proof. Sometimes that can help speed up the search, but it also reduces the likelihood of finding one. Okay. We're going to leave the search step at the four, and now we're going to go up here and click on the allowed statements. We're not going to need all these steps. Only certain steps with certain statements are going to be what we're needing. Okay, we know we only need really this 2 plus 1 plus 1 and the 4 is 2 plus 1 plus 1. Okay, that's the two sides we know we're connecting. 
So we're going to remove the ones that don't matter. Okay. Now we may need those steps later, so I'm going to check off these and say, hey, we're going to possibly use those steps, the statements in those steps here and here. We won't worry about the other ones. Every step I, rem I don't include means that the uh, process can speed up. Okay, and now we're going to click on Prove. So here's some general tips about bottom-up searches. I find it really, really helpful to choose several different search options, trying out different things, but starting with ones that run quickly, but are less likely to automatically find a proof. Okay. If those quick approaches don't work out, then I'm going to modify the search parameters so that I'm more likely to be successful, but of course then those are going to take more time. And of course, repeatedly using the tool is going to give you a better sense of what's more or less likely to work. Okay. Notice it didn't take us all that long, and in fact, I found a number of different ways to uh, prove these claims. Okay, uh, Lots of different ways to prove it, it turns out. Um, it doesn't matter um, in the grand sense, of course, because once it's proven, it's proven. Um, you know, but you can see, in fact, I found many, many different ways to prove it. I'm going to pick one of these first ones here, okay, and apply selected. Okay, it's a slightly different proof, but it's still proving the final result. All right, so let's click on settings over here, and you will notice that you can check all, you can change all sorts of things. So, for example, if you want the long click to be longer or shorter, that's fine. If you want to be able to edit statements by doing a simple click instead of a long click, you can change that too. There's various other settings that you can adjust. But if you change something, you, you do need to click on apply changes. Until you do that, it doesn't count. Okay, so, alrighty. Now, let's go back uh, to the editor, okay? If you have a small screen, there's other tricks you can do to take advantage of your limited screen space. Okay, click on the icon right here, and you can change your view options. And you can disable displaying of various things. Um, I already mentioned that if you're on a small screen, you probably want compact mode and small buttons. But you might also want to disable some of the things if you don't need them for now. So for example, if you don't need to have the labels removed, you know, don't show them. If you don't need to see the justifications, you can hide them too. Now, there's an interesting trick. Justifications take a fair amount of screen space. So if you remove them, yes, obviously it takes less screen space, but sometimes you want to be able to see a justification for something specific, okay? So what you need to be able to, what you can do is unify, to show our green check marks again, okay? Uh, okay, and now we can take some, if you want to see the justification of a particular step without having to see all the steps okay just click on uh, just do a simple click on one of these green check marks when um you know, when you're hiding the justifications and now what it'll do first is it will show justifications just the justification and again you can edit it you can delete it okay uh, but now once you've shown this you can then reveal the visualization so you can show a visualization for a particular case without showing the visualization or even the name even the justifications for all and i'm going to minimize that back okay you can do some other things too if you click on this you can click on hide tabs and this will hide the editor versus settings and so on again a little more screen space the problem of course is that now i'm going gee how do i go change my settings that's no problem go click on the menu button again and show the tabs and it comes right back okay um, you can also hide the context. Now, in uh, in this, uh, in, to do that, I need to go over to settings. I will hide the context header. I'm going to click on apply changes. And now yeah, I can't see that anymore. Okay, great. How do I reveal the context saying, well, I'm going to have to uh, go back to my editor, first of all. I'm going to click on the menu button now and show context. And this lets me see the context even when I'm in this particular setting. Let me go back to the setting. I, I'm in a big screen. I don't really need that. Okay, so I'm going to undo that. Okay. All right, let me move my, my little head back up here. All right, there we go. 
All right. If you have, or of course, if you're using a web browser, you could also just change the font size, make it smaller, make it bigger. Obviously, the trade off here is smaller fonts. You can have, put in more symbols, but they'll be getting, they'll get harder and harder to read the smaller they get. Um, if you're in Chrome, you use uh, settings accessibility to adjust the text settings. And similarly for Firefox, you use settings accessibility. You'll need to disable the automatic font sizing and then you can adjust it. Okay, um, that's at least one way to do it. All right, and with that, uh, there's more to be said about MetaMath Lamp, but hopefully this at least gives you an idea about how to use the MetaMath Lamp tool. Thank you very, very much for your time.